Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Beverly Hills Bar webinar entitled Key Tam 101, a field guide to False Claims Act and other whistleblower actions that address corporate fraud and employer misconduct. This is presented by the Labor and Employment Section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. My name is Peter Marks. I'm a mediator with ARC, and I'm active with the Labor and Employment Section. We have a very interesting program today, and I want to get right to it. So there are just a couple of administrative tasks that I'm going to address so that we can move into the substance of the program. First of all, you will receive a certificate of attendance with respect to MCLE compliance in the next day or so. That will be handled by the bar. Secondly, our speaker has indicated that he will be happy to entertain questions uh, during the course of the presentation. And the manner in which you raise the questions is to go, well, there are two, there are two possibilities. Either in, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little tab or button which says Q&A. You can click on that and type in your question. And then next to it should be another button that says chat, and you can click on that and raise your question. And I will be monitoring those questions, and at the appropriate times, I will raise them so that the speaker can respond. Finally, uh, I want to express my thanks to Gena Kulushnikov, and again, I apologize if I've massacred your name, and Alex Krut, who through their expertise, uh, well, Gena is, is uh, director of the of membership, um, what is Gena director of? Mem he's director of membership matters, something of that nature. I've forgotten the exact title. And it is through their technical expertise that we are able to present this webinar today through the uh, Zoom facility. So I want to express my, uh, our thanks to both of them for their efforts. It's very much appreciated. Now, as to the program itself, whistleblowers have been um, in the news for the last year or so, and I think it's not unreasonable to expect that they will be in the news for quite some time. Our speaker is Mark Kleiman, and Mark has extensive experience and expertise on this subject, having long advocated for whistleblowers and having recovered hundreds of millions of dollars in such matters. Um, his bio should be in the materials, which by the way, you, you should have received or will receive. And if you wish to know more, Mark, Mark you're, you're welcome to peruse that bio. Among other things, Mark will enlighten us as to the intricacies of key TAM actions and other aspects of this unique field. And with that, I'm very happy to introduce Mark Kleiman. Well, thank you, Peter. I really appreciate that warm introduction. I should hasten to add that the hundreds of millions was for the government, since it's the government that's the victim of uh, in these kinds of cases. Um, our clients only get somewhere between 15 and 25% of that hundreds of millions of dollars. So this wasn't all going to the whistleblowers, but um, at, at least some of them are happy. Uh, what I'd like to do is explain primarily how the False Claims Act works um, and spend some time talking about how it works in conjunction with um, traditionally raised employment issues um, and for a very simple reason. Um, almost nobody wakes up in the morning frustrated with um, what they believe to be corrupt or illegal action on the job and says, you know, I'm going to file a false claims case. What far more typically happens is they say, I'm going to talk to somebody about this. They try to correct what their companies are doing um, and, of course, then get run over by management um, and wind up um, looking for employment lawyers. So there's a very, very um, important overlay to understand between how the employment cases work and the false claims cases work. Uh, this is a remarkably successful program. The law was amended um, in 1986. The amendments kicked in in 1987. And since then, you can see um, what's been recovered 
for the state and federal governments. I'll explain the role the states play in a bit. Um, a couple of studies have been done showing that somewhere, um, depending on which jurisdiction you look at, um, the return on investment is between about 14 or $15 for every dollar spent on False Claims Act enforcement and $30 for everybody, every dollar spent on False Claims Act enforcement. And as you might well expect with a program that this is, is this successful, it makes um, a lot of enemies, both outside the government and therefore inside the government as well. But it is a remarkably successful um, enterprise. Ironically enough, um, the amendments were passed in 1986 when Ronald Reagan was president. He did not veto it. Um, the bill was championed in the House of Representatives by our then local hero, Howard Berman, and in the Senate by Republican Senator Chuck Grassley, who's gone on to be periodically chair of Senate Judiciary, chair of Senate Finance. Um, and Senator Grassley has in many ways been the patron saint of whistleblowers, both in the US Senate and in the um, Republican Party in general. And he still um, champions the act. And um, when Jeff Sessions was there, would Hector Jeff Sessions, now he Hector's Attorney General Barr. Um, so to a large extent, this really is a uniquely program. Um, how do you get to $59 billion in recovery for, um, a pro, uh, for uh, in federal funds? Well, this is how. Under the statute, for every dollar a company has stolen, they have to repay three. That's, of course, if it, you go to trial and you get a judgment. Um, like any other settlement in any other civil case, um, the um, reality is that it's they usually settle for double damages or two and a half times damages. And of course, the real key is not so much what is the multiplier, but how are the damages calculated? There's also, and this can be very significant, a civil penalty. Um, in the original law, it was written as a penalty between five and $10,000. And with inflation, it's now bumped up to between 11 and a half and $23,000 for each false claim submitted, um, which of course, um, as you might imagine, leads to great debates over how you count a claim. If a form is used um, to submit 15 or 20 claims on a single form, is each claim a separate claim because it's a different date of service, perhaps a different patient or a, um, a, a different product? Or is each piece of paper a claim? Um, those are the kinds of fights you get into. But you, you get into really, really very significant recoveries. The idea behind the treble damages was twofold. One, you really wanted to have a deterrent effect. The, and number two, um, this way, there's money to fund the program. There's money to pay the whistleblowers who under the law get a share of this. Um, and the government can pretty much count on being made whole, at the very least, in any one of these. Um, we're, these are the key elements of the False Claims Act. Um, and the, the citation to the statute, or at least the section of the statute, is at the top. We're going to go over each of these elements in um, great and boring detail, but I wanted to lay out the the essentials. There are four ways to get in trouble um, as a de potential defendant in the False Claims Act. Um, the first is to knowingly present, and here's the really interesting kicker, or cause someone else to present a false or fraudulent claim. Um, so all, right, right away, you've got three vocabulary terms that have unique meaning within this statute that we're going to get into later. Um, now, the first 
real type of offense is to present a false or fraudulent claim. And you'll see the last couple of words up there, for payment or approval. Separate and apart from that, using a false record or, mis or statement that is material to the claim um, is also a way that you can um, incur liability. A third is conspiring with somebody else to violate the False Claims Act. And the fourth, um, rather than read the whole thing to you, let me shorthand it. It's basically called a reverse false claim. Um, a friend of mine, formerly in the Justice Department, who went to law school at the University of South Carolina, I don't know if it's true or apocryphal, but she insisted that one of her professors had the aphorism, he who takes what isn't his own must give it back or go to prison. And that is essentially what the reverse false claims are about. In other words, if you've got money you shouldn't have that belongs to the government, whether the government um, gave it to you by accident or um, whether you got it through any other means. Um, and you really know that you probably shouldn't have it. You got to pay it back. If you don't pay it back, that itself is actionable. Um, and we'll get into some examples of how that comes up when you see people trying to avoid fines, um, avoid paying regulatory expenses, that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, and the item, and it's on the right-hand side, um, falsity, causation, what's a claim, what does knowledge mean, we're about to dive into, but I wanted you to also have this on one, um, one slide so you would have something of a key terms cheat sheet. So here we go. Um, seen one false claims act, you've seen maybe a bit more than one false claims act this stuff has been so successful that 29 states and now the district of columbia have their own false claims acts they vary um from one another in some interesting respects you'll note that california has a false claims act if you wind up looking at a case like this you want to pay attention to what the states what states are involved, if any, for two key reasons. The first is that if there are some programs where the cost of the program are shared between the state and the federal governments. Medi-Cal is a great example. In California, the feds pick up 50% of the bill for Medi-Cal. So if you file a False Claims Act um, for fraud that involves the Medi-Cal program, but you only file it under the federal statute, your client's only gonna get a share of the federal recovery. You have cut your client off from recovering, in California's case, um, a share of the, that half of the money that goes to the states. Um, so where if you're talking to a client who's describing what's going on, learn about the program, teach yourself whether there is state money or just exclusively federal money involved, and then take a look at the state statute. Um, they're not all the same. In Texas, for example, um, it's Medicaid only. So I could catch somebody defrauding the Texas Department of Highways, wouldn't do anybody any good because that's not part of their False Claims Act. Um, some states also have um, anti-retaliation provisions in their statutes that are stronger or at least divergent from what's in the federal statute. So it's worth taking a look. The other reason is um, there is just much more fraud than there are investigators and agents to go around. And if you can develop a sound theory about why the state has been defrauded to and pull the states in, some of their investigative powers and lawyers and agents will come into play. So the first part, the first word in false, false claims is false. What in fact is a false claim? 
it's interesting. The statute doesn't define what is false, which is probably just as well, because every time a new government program comes into existence or a new way of regulating or looking at a government program is established, there are new forms of falsity um, that come into existence. Um, just as a brief example, uh, it used to be in healthcare when all you had was fee-for-service medicine. Those of us who are Peters in my ages will remember those days. Um, uh, the way a doctor or a hospital would make an extra buck might be by saying they did more than they've done or doing things that weren't necessary. Now in the days of managed care with these Medicare Advantage programs and that sort of thing, you can actually make money if you're a United or a Humana or an Anthem by doing less than is needed and shortchanging patients because there's a prepaid amount, um, you know, the uh, providers and the health plans get every month. So there's a real protein um, definition uh, of what is a false claim that can expand or contract depending on um, what, what, what's at stake. And there are decisions out there that say that um, the act has been deliberately drafted and interpreted this way because there's no way of anticipating what kind of fraud people are going to be thinking about committing. Um, there are basically, if you could think of a um, four squared table of columns, you can have false statements that are either expressly false um, or implicitly false. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, if I have um, tested a product that I'm shipping to the government, say some new ventilators, and I know that the um, ventilators don't do everything that they are supposed to be doing, um, my shipping them and signing a certification that the ventilators are fine is expressly false. I know it's false. I know what the story is behind the ventilators, et cetera. So let's suppose, however, that because I think there may be some manufacturer problem, manufacturing problems or some design problems, I just don't test them. I decide I'm going to close my eyes and plug up my ears, and maybe they're okay, maybe they're not. Well, my sending them to the government and presenting a bill for payment um, is itself considered an implicit statement that this stuff is okay and this stuff ought to be paid. Um, and that, therefore, um, my not knowing that, and we'll get into knowledge in a second, creates an implicitly false statement. Why does the law work that way? The genesis of this um, is actually the Civil War, because the statute was created in 1863 in the middle of the Civil War. Um, uh, barrels of food that were supposed to be going to troops um, were rotten and full of worms. Barrels of gunpowder were filled with dust and ash, that sort of thing. And amazingly, contractors would say stuff like, well, you said 50 barrels of food. You didn't say it had to be good food or edible food. Now, you'd think, oh God, people would say that in 1863, maybe. Nobody would be dumb enough to say that today. Wrong. Um, when the US invaded Afghanistan, um, it, you know, after 9-11, um, the US quickly discovered it had logistic problems and began contracting um, with a number of private companies to acquire and may, to get the companies to acquire and deliver working trucks, large tractor trailers, because there wasn't the 
Um, the army had not planned on having to move things all over the country as much as they would. Um, somebody got a contract for, if I remember right, close to 20,000 tractor trailers, most of which didn't work. And the defense, I kid you not, this is in this century, was, well, you didn't say they had to be operate, operational. But people still do stuff like this. Um, there can be, an, hence the expre express and implicit distinction. What's the difference between a factually false and a legally false um, statement? What on earth does that mean? How can something that is true still be legally false? Here's how. Um, when you go to see your doctor and your doctor um, drops a bill to Medicare or whoever that, and she says she's done the following 18 things for you. And in fact, she has only done seven of them. That is a factually false statement. Um, but let's say that she then refers you to a radiologist for a CAT scan. And she picks the radiologist not because she thinks that office um, does the best and most efficient work, but because she's getting some money back from the radiologist. In fact, it's true she referred you to the radiologist, and it's true the radiologist performed the CAT scan, but the statement is still a legally false statement because both she and the radiologist to apply to get authorized to bill Medicare or Medi-Cal and sign things saying, I'm not going to bribe anybody, nor will I accept bribes. Therefore, bills that are generated because of the bribes are treated as though they are legally false. And finally, of course, and this is a standard common law concept, the statute reaches misrepresentation by omission. Um, you can't, to use a very current example, um, be the Los Angeles Lakers, um, tell the SBA you're a small business and say, oh, we just dropped a couple of zeros when we told you how many employees we had um, or what our gross revenue was. Um, and it, it, it is all an innocent mistake. So you can scrutinize these things greatly to get to what is false and what is fraudulent. Um, obligation is another term because this comes up in the context of the reverse um, False Claims Act cases, but it also comes up in the context of cases where people are presenting um, a claim. Um, here's the deal. If a company has a duty um, to either pay something back to the government or get something from the government, even if it's not from the government directly, if the source of funds is government money, it is still treated as an obligation under the False Claims Act and one sufficient to trigger um, liability for a direct false claim if you're asking for money from the government or for a reverse false claim if you're um, failing uh, to pay money back that you ought to be. Materiality, again, a common law concept that gets a real working over in this statute. Um, the false claims, act, I mean, it stands to reason just from a common law perspective that a fraud that is not material isn't really going to count for much. So judicially, the standard for a very long time had been whether or not a false statement had what the courts called a natural tendency to um, influence the decision maker, whoever it was in the government who um, was actually going to decide whether a claim should be paid. Um, 
about five years ago, four years ago, Justice Thomas um, in a decision called um, U.S. X. Well, the case was U.S. X. Rel. Escobar versus United Health Services. By the time it got to the Supreme Court, of course, the caption flipped. So it's United Health Services, um, the Escobar. Um, Justice Thomas took this issue up, even though it hadn't been raised in the district court, hadn't been raised in the First Circuit, and hadn't been briefed by any of the parties, um, and elected to write a dissertation on what it is to say that a claim is material. Um, since then, where there had been relatively few decisions discussing materiality before, we've had dozens of them in the last um, really in the last five years. Um, Justice Thomas and the, I've said some things in that opinion that the business community has picked up and run right out of the park with, um, and the courts are still struggling with it. Um, what he said was that me, uh, the government merely saying that something is a condition of payment, as in we won't pay you unless you promise that X or unless you promise that Y, doesn't matter. Don't, he says, look at what the government says, but look at what it does. So if the government continues to pay claims um, after it knows that false claims are being submitted, according to Justice Thomas, that's a big deal. Um, the problem arises, of course, when you've got programs that you can't stop in the middle uh, being going to disrupt. And if you stop, if you t tell a company you're pulling its contracts, there are real consequences. So, for example, um, when the manufacturer of a device to detect IEDs um, the improvised explosive devices that became so popular in Iraq and Afghanistan um, begins dramatically overcharging the government. The government began looking at it and did in fact do something about it, but it didn't take the contract away from this company because right at that point they were the only people making and shipping these things. And they, you know, somebody in the Pentagon thought it would be a good idea to continue having them made and shipped and deal with the financial end later. Similarly, when you find a large chain of nursing homes submitting false claims, yeah, one of your choices is to nationally throw 40 or 50,000 patients out into the street all at once, but that's not necessarily a good choice. There are all sorts of countervailing considerations. So what many of the appellate courts have come to is sort of a holistic analysis that takes into consideration um, the Escobar thought that, you know, if the government continues to pay claims it knows are false, it's worth looking at, but says that's basically one consideration. You can't um, stop the inquiry there. What Escobar, the Escobar decision did do, um, and this is, um, well, we could de debate the value of this effect. It's been a real problem in significant areas, is basically eliminate a class of cases where the government said, we're giving you this money so long as you agree to do certain things with it. You promise not to pollute, or you promise you're going to source goods from U.S. manufacturers, or at least from manufacturers who have most favored nation trading status, the Trade America Act, that sort of thing. Um, or if you're a certain kind of public benefit corporation, yeah, we're giving you these contracts as sole source contracts. You don't have to bid competitively, but you've got to give back to the community. Um, there's now a raging debate um, that whistleblowers are often losing about whether or not those social requirements um, within statutes um, and in various government programs are still 
um, going to be enforced. Um, so here are some of the kickers with materiality. The defendants are always going to really paint with as broad a brush as possible the idea that the government knew something was false and then paid it anyway, and therefore it didn't care. Um, in fact, it's uh, you can often get um, declarations from people who had been in responsible administrative positions fairly high up in prior administrations who will tell you things like, yeah, and these are not political appointees, these are just real life public servants. Yeah, we did know about this and we did care, but there are all these countervailing concerns. Not only that, I cannot with the stroke of a pen simply take people out of participating in various government programs. There's due process to follow, there are appeals to follow. We don't always have the strongest case. Suspicion isn't enough, et cetera. So um, this stuff is very much in play. And the second block there, um, I've listed just some of the cases um, that, that you can follow to see how this all, all goes. If you'd like um, more on this, I can just bore you to death with it. Shoot me an email or call me sometime and we'll chat. Um, some of the other issues that come up here. Knowingly, what does it mean to submit a false claim knowingly? Um, the statute is very specific in saying that intent to defraud is not required. Reckless disregard is enough. Deliberate indifference is enough. So if you decide um, that they're better off just not knowing the answer, killing um, money, um, from the government, they can. Uh, they, they cannot proceed along the basis of, well, we didn't know and we didn't really want to find out. Um, and there's a lot of room to apply common sense circumstantial evidence um, in this kind of situation to build a case that there was either deliberate indifference or, um, you know, or, or reckless disregard. Um, I call this a modification of the Oliver Wendell Holmes story, not Justice Holmes, who we all read, read about in law school, but his daddy, the first Oliver Wendell Holmes, who famously intoned that even a dog understands the difference between being kicked and being stumbled over in the dark of night. Um, the statute is aimed either at the dog kickers or the people who know it's dark out and then blindfold themselves and don't shine a light. Um, if somebody takes reasonable steps and makes a good faith, honest mistake on um, this statute with its tremendously punitive consequences um, is not going to come into play. And everybody recognizes that there is room for those kinds of mistakes. This statute requires um, pretty much a gross negligence standard. Um, timing. Next to location, timing is everything. There's a very long tail on this. Um, I could file a case tomorrow about things that had happened in 2014. And in fact, I could also often go back fully nine years all the way um, to 2011 because the statute does not really sink in until the responsible US, three years after the responsible US official knows about the fraud. Who is the responsible US official for these purposes? The Attorney General, because um, it's DOJ that brings the false claims case. So the fact that the Department of Education knew or the Department of Energy knew is, doesn't matter. The question the courts will ask is, does um, the Justice Department know about, about what is happening or is it at least on inquiry? Um, let's talk for a minute about whistleblower retaliation. 
um, and how it works under the statute. Um, when I put this graphic on, I was, I was debating whether um, the um, firing of the, um, the, anti, uh, the, the rocket launcher represented the retaliation or the whistleblower's response. I would like to think the latter, although I'm not sure. Um, the False Claims Act is really a public policy tort on steroids in many ways. Um, here's what the anti-retaliation provisions do. First of all, they are extremely broad. You don't have to be an employee if you're a contractor and wind up getting punished because you blew the whistle, or if you're just acting on behalf of an entity as some kind of agent and you blow the whistle. Um, that's enough to, for you to be protected under the False Claims Act. What is protected? Um, is it just reporting it to the government? No. Is it complaining, just complaining internally? No. Any lawful act, in, either in support of investigating the false claims case or trying to stop the fraud yourself, creates protection. Um, what acts are and are not lawful? It's not clear. You do get into questions of what the defense bar calls document theft, what we like to call document rescue. Um, and But there are ways of dealing with that, as in don't take the documents, take pictures of the documents. Um, I had one nurse who simply was faxing herself stuff from work and would fax it to her home fax machine in the, day, in the days before email was popular. Um, or um, if you can do it without detection, make copies of things um, onto a flash drive. All of that is lawful. There may be civil consequences if an employer wants to go after somebody, but it's not. Here is the breadth of the protections. Associational retaliation is prohibited. So somebody comes into your office and says, my friend at work was suspected of being a whistleblower and because I always used to go have lunch with her, now I'm in trouble. They're protected. Secondhand retaliation is protected. What do I mean by secondhand? Okay, I've blown the whistle on my old company. I realize I'm going to get in trouble. I go to get a job with another company, either uh, likely some, somebody in the same industry. Either they're doing business with my old boss or they at least know my old boss. My old boss thinks I've um, uh, blown the whistle on them and gets my new employer to fire me. Also illegal under the False Claims Act. It is a very, very broad statute. Um, so here is sort of the potential power of the statute. First of all, there's a three-year statute of limitations federally on this. So um, whatever you might worry about in terms of a California-based statute of limitations, um, you've got this uh, extra time here, which is not to say you don't want to file the case relatively quickly, because as you'll note when you go, we go down the list of the power of the statute, um, What's missing from this list is punitive damages, which means that if you have an 1102.5 claim or some other common law claim that you think will work in California and get you to punitive damages, you want to make sure that your claim is brought within the uh, statute of limitations under the California statute. So look at the remedies. Double back pay which is great, front pay, emotional distress, statutory fees, just like your FIHA claims. And the one I love best here is reinstatement. Now, my clients are always saying, I'm not going back to work for them. Are you kidding? Say, yes, but we're not going to tell them that yet. Because as much as you don't want to go to work for them, they don't want you back. And you're offer to agree to not come back is going to be worth something very significant. 
and it often is because it, the requirement under the law is reinstatement with full seniority. And I have seen companies do backflips to avoid being to made to rehire somebody. There's this other note I put up here, tactical discovery. What do I mean by that? Well, we'll get into the mechanics of the False Claims Act in just a second, but the important thing to know is that the cases are filed under seal, which means that DOJ knows about them, the U.S. Attorney's Office knows about them, your defendant doesn't know about them. And sometimes those cases remain under seal for years and years. Um, nationally, the average is two to three years. Um, that's optimistic. In cases that have a lot of moving parts because the fraud is national or regional in scheme, it's, I, I mean, I've had cases I thought were going to be old enough to drink, drive, and vote before they came out from under seal. If you need to hurry things along, there is always the potential of using your employment case as a stalking horse to get some discovery done, all the while the case is under seal and all the while it's languishing, um, and you can learn some things that way. That one advantage turns into a significant disadvantage, though, and let me talk a bit about some of the potential drawbacks here. Um, first of all, uh, we're in federal court um, under a, um, an employment discrimination case that came out about three years ago, NASSAR, N-A-S-S-A-R, versus, if I remember right, I want to say University of Texas at San Antonio Medical Center, but having said that, I'm no happier. But it's a Fifth Circuit case. Under Nasser, it was not enough, no longer enough for the discrimination to be um, a substantial factor. That test is gone. It's now got to, we are now in the, back in the land of but for causation. Um, and that line of judicial thinking has been whistleblower retaliation cases under the Federal False Claims Act. Um, so where you've got multiple causes or where you've got um, a colorable defense argument that maybe something needed to be done with the whistleblower anyway, um, you're going to have a tougher road to hoe here. Um, the other issues are all issues related to timing. And as an employment lawyers, you really have to balance the False Claims Act against your client's need for rapid resolution. Um, when I'm thinking about taking a case, one of my questions to the whistleblower is always prospects like, are you going to be able to get another job and sort of ride this out for a while? Um, here is why it matters. The good news is that we are in a settle and sue jury, which means that your client can sign a release of all claims and a 1542 waiver and still proceed with her false claims case. The uh, under many, not all conditions, but under many conditions, most. Um, the rationale behind it is um, the public policy issue. The purpose of the False Claims Act is to get information that whistleblowers have in the hands of the government. And if signing an employment release was going to disincentivize people, um, so goes the theory, um, that would frustrate the purpose of the statute. And therefore, unless the government already knows about the fraud for a couple of reasons, and has had an opportunity to investigate it, releases um, are not going to be honored. It puts people like Peter in a really interesting position. Um, he could be mediating an employment case and have heard from the plaintiff's lawyer that there's an underlying false claims case. Um, this release is going to get signed he knows it's um, perhaps not enforceable. 
um, which is certainly something the defendant doesn't know. Um, all I can say is thank goodness for the mediation privilege. It's an interesting problem. You want to, even though you've got that ultimate protection for your clients, you want to avoid it if you can for two reasons. Mark, if I may, uh, please. Uh, um, I'm wondering if the, and I don't know the answer to this off the top of my head, but I recall something about the mediation confidentiality not extending to criminal acts. Now, I don't know whether the false claims uh, activity might, or the activity leading to the false claim might be deemed criminal, uh, but that's a question that uh, would have to be considered in that situation by any mediator. That is a, thank you for that correction, and that is a really interesting question. Um, that, all, that comes up, by the way, in terms of um, defendants' insurance uh, coverage for possible false claims acts, um, because this is sort of the classic wobbler. Um, since you can be liable under the False Claims Act, even if you did not have a specific intent to violate it, if you were merely being reckless or deliberately indifferent to something, um, you could be deliberately indifferent to a lot of things, and a prosecutor would have a very hard time proving, if you were genuinely in, deliberately indifferent, proving that you knew what was going on and committed the fraud. So there's a real um, where that, uh, you know, how that shades into gray here. And I had not thought about it from the perspective of um, what the mediator knows. As a practical matter, probably the questions to ask um, the plaintiff's employment lawyer would include, is the criminal division sitting in on meetings with your client and the civil false claims attorneys? Um, have the subpoenas that have gone out been OIG administrative subpoenas, OIG being the Office of the Inspector General of the various federal agencies, or are these um, or, or, or have people been getting information via search warrants, um, which gets you much closer to um, understanding what at least the government's thinking is about what kind of case there may be out there. I, I don't know if that helps. Um, the other issue, and this is where this gets, well, even if you, your client signs a release like this, um, it could affect you and your client around the margins. Signing a release like that, your client is opening him or herself up to the idea that the government, if it wanted to, could at least threaten, and they have done this before, to say, we don't think your client's a real relator because um, there's a you know, that this release was signed and you, but you might not fit in, you might, we might fit into one of the exceptions. So therefore, we want to give your client less money. Similarly, when you go to try to resolve your claim for attorney's fees with the government, you're going to hear a similar argument potentially from the defense lawyer. So it can hurt around the margins, even in a safe jurisdiction like the Ninth Circuit. One comment, Mark, if yeah, I may. Please. Uh, I have had mediate, well, a few mediations where the, the defendant's ac actions or alleged actions had potential criminal consequences. And the release, the, the civil lawyer brought in a criminal defense lawyer to help draft the release language uh, to obviously to try and avoid any criminal sanctions. I'm wondering if the employment lawyer in a situation where there's a possible key TAM action should bring in someone such as yourself to help craft the language to not uh, unwittingly obstruct any possible key TAM action? Um, that, that, that is an interesting question. Um, what sophisticated defense counsel do um, is basically include boilerplate language that says, we're, you know, you're agreeing not to talk to anybody at all about this, except the government if the government asks questions, um, number one. Number two, um, 
they will say, sorry about that. They will say, um, if you are contacted by the government, obviously you can talk to them, but we're requesting that you let us know that um, a government inquiry had, you know, has begun. Sometimes um, employers will attempt to insert language saying I, uh, that people certify that they haven't filed a False Claims Act case, that they haven't, um, you know, that they have not, um, you know, um, reported the fraud to the government, um, and they, that this is material and a false statement here is grounds for rescission. Um, when I talk to employment lawyers about this, my suggestion to them is that that's a deal breaker. Um, you know, if the money that you're getting in the employment case is worth anything, um, you could potentially have to pay it back. You don't know what's going to happen with the False Claims Act case, whether it's going to be successful. You're putting your client in jeopardy and taking <clears throat> a fee that your client's not going to be able to repay fully. Um, time to file a 998 and um, let them accept judgment or not accept judgment. And if they don't, um, you know, it's time to go earn the money. Um, I have not found very many defendants are interested in my hinting about, how shall I put this? my hinting about how to craft that part of the release to avoid criminal consequences, because frankly, I've been chicken to raise it um, at risk of suggesting to somebody that there's a false claims case in the background, which when it's still under seal is nothing you really want to hint about. Um, so here is the problem with the seal. And cannot effectively serve both masters. On the one hand, you have to tell your client when you file this case, you can't talk to anybody about it. You can't talk to your former coworkers. You can't talk to your family. People will tell their spouses. And usually everybody just rolls their eyes and lets that go. Nobody gets excited. Uh, but you can't tell your adult children. Um, you can't tell the, your friends in your book club, mum's the word, which can be a real problem in some situations. And the separate employment case is one of them, because on the one hand, you have a client who has been ordered by the federal court not to mention the false claims case. On the other hand, your client is getting interrogatories. Um, asking her to state under penalty of perjury every other lawsuit she's filed. Um, or that's going to get asked in a deposition. And you really have, it's really dicey to negotiate both of these. Um, the, about the only thing that works is tell the assistant U.S. attorney on your case what the problem is. Um, let them know that you're going to be going to the federal court and asking for an order that will partially lift the seal I've been talking about, just for the limited purpose of explaining to the superior court judge why you can't answer these questions. And then with that order, going in and trying to have an ex parte conversation um, with your superior court judge, something they just love. <laughs> Mark, uh, we have yeah. one comment. We have yeah. Marcus Mancini has raised an interesting point. Going back to the uh, standard of proof and retaliation, and Marcus in the chat room uh, writes that under 1102.5, the standard of proof is found in 1102.6, and it's quote contributing factor close quote, which in Marcus's opinion is a wee bit better than quote substantial motivating reason close quote, for under the FIHA. In other words, the standard of proof in that situation might be a little bit more easy to meet for the prospective uh, retaliation plaintiff. Marcus, if I haven't stated this right, put something else in the chat room, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I think Marcus is dead right about this. Um, it is a more forgiving standard. 
Um, and in some cases, in addition to that, in healthcare, you get the additional advantage of the health and safety code provision, um, saying that if the retaliation occurs within four months of the whistleblower complaint or the suspected whistleblower complaint, complaint there's a presumption that attaches um, the, the, that the whole thing was retaliatory. Um, a, uh, Marcus, you brought up another great reason about why it is smart to um, plead both the, you know, both the state and federal, um, you know, provisions of the statute, um, because you can you can hopefully get the advantage of the additional remedies, but you also can get the advantage of the more forgiving evidentiary standards. And Marcus oh. states that uh, that what we just discussed is correct and that most defendants in 1102.5 cases try to argue the but-for standard, and as he puts it, and they're wrong. Hey, but they always try to argue that. Yes, they, uh, you know, I, I, I've wondered whether it's deliberate ignorance or willful disregard of the law. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, they, they they do they do that stuff all the time. So um, the short form answer is it's really worth it if you've got a um, decent false claims case. Um, that you know there are a number of people in LA who do this. Call me up if you want. Um, terrific lawyer who does both um, whistleblower law and general plaintiff's employment law, Will Harris, um, does the same. There are a bunch of people who do both of these, uh, you know, who, who do work in both of these areas. Call somebody up and, you know, uh, we'll make up answers if we don't know the, know the right one. Um, it, it's... The, the nice thing about keeping the employment cases under seal, which is the other solution, you file it as part of the False Claims Act case um, if your client can afford the delay. Um, and you ask the court, since the court has no particular reason or immediate authority to keep the whole thing under seal to accept ancillary jurisdiction of the employment case, they always do, since they arise out of the same set of facts, the whole thing remains under seal. And typically, if the false claims case is going to resolve, um, resolution of the employment case, the defendant really only wants to have one bad news day. And if they've committed a fraud, you're giving every reporter who wants to take a swing at them a hook to a news hook um, every time you're going into court on the subsequent employment case. So it's rare that the employment cases, if you filed them as part of a false claims case, um, often on very favorable terms at the end of the false claims case itself. Um, let me talk a bit about the other economic end of this, and which is what does the whistleblower get out of this? And why would somebody want to subject themselves to this madness? Um, here is why. Um, the recoveries come in two flavors. If the government joins the party, your client gets between 15 and 25% of the recovery, which can in some cases be very substantial. Um, that, of course, gives the defense something to talk about when your client's deposed. I train my clients to simply say, well, look, I haven't, uh, you, you know, the, the question on cross is inevitably, well, you stand to make 30 or $40 million or millions of dollars. And I, my clients usually respond saying, well, you know, I understand that I get a percentage of the fraud, and I think my company's committed a lot of fraud. And we, ju we just leave it at that and don't do the math. If the government declines the case, you're free to go ahead on your own. 
and the percentage range bumps up from 15 to 25 to 25 to 30. So how, by the way, does this get resolved between 15 and 25 or 25 and 30? Um, most of the time, it's a negotiation with the Justice Department. And what they count on is that by the time this case is over, your client is so exhausted, they just want to be done with it and don't have any fight left in them. We have another question, if I may, Mark. Uh, what if the plaintiff uh, himself or herself has unclean hands? Can the plaintiff be involved with the fraud and still have some form of recovery, or does that disqualify any such plaintiff? Great question, and thank you for that. That was um, from Amir Far... Oh, gosh, I'm going to butcher this name. Amir Farshi. I hope I've not mispronounced the name. Well, Amir, you put your... Your, fin your, your, your hands, clean or unclean, right <laughs> on a big question here. The statute only bars recovery for people, who, and note the conjunctive here, have planned and initiated the fraud. So if your client walks into a company and after being hired is told, this is how we do this here. And because she's still trying to get her sea legs and wants to keep her job, um, does it for a while, um, or even does it for a really long time, so long as they did not plan and initiate the fraud, that they weren't the intellectual authors of the scheme, um, they stand to recover. My favorite example of this is not a case of my own, um, a case of um, a friend of mine, Jim Helmer in Cincinnati. Um, right after the statute was amended, um, somebody came into his office and told basically the following story. General Electric, in addition to bringing good things to light, as they used to like to say, had a license to sell military aircraft to friendly nations. Um, and they decided they wanted to sell F-14 fighter bombers to Israel, which was a problem only because the Israelis had historically bought French mirages. So how are you going to persuade the Israeli Defense Force to change? The answer is you bribe Rafi Dotan, the head of the IDF. Um, so for years, the whistleblower would fly over in a company plane with duffel bags full of $100 bills, drop them off at Dotan's house, leave, come back to the U.S., wash, rinse, repeat, etc. Now, that was not the false claim, by the way. In a spectacular bit of greed, GE actually charged the cost of the bribes, $28 million worth of bribes, off to what was called a military assistance contract because the Pentagon paid GE to train the Israelis in how to fly and maintain the aircraft. So we were paying for GE to bribe the Israelis is what it came down to. That was the false claim. Um, well, when GE finally figures out who the whistleblower is, because his hands were a little unclean, he, um, GE's head is exploded. And there's a, there was a, a $28 million fraud. Treble damages were applied. GE wound up paying back fully $84 million and came roaring into court, denouncing the whistleblower. The judge listened, thought about it a while, and said, you know, you're right. I can't give this guy 25%. I'm going to give him 22.5%. Um, that's what happens if your hands are dirty. The statute's premise is not that these people are angels. The statute's premise is the old line, to catch a thief, set another thief upon him. That the people who really have interesting information, insider information, are going to have been very close to the scams themselves. So that's why this is written very narrowly. Unless your client really is the intellectual author of the scheme, they don't, uh, they can't be zeroed out. Um, the government may have some things to say about their involvement and how long they were involved 
and why they are therefore entitled to a small a share on the smaller end of that 15 to 25 percent range. But there is going to be a, a recovery in there. Um, the other thing, again, because this is a fee shifting statute and a cost shifting statute, you're a timekeeper here, the same way you would be in a FIHA case. So keep t good track of your time. You don't need a fancy spreadsheet I uh, or software program. I just use Excel. It works fine. Um, don't block bill. Um, you know, err a bit on the side of conservatism because your bills are going to be scrutinized. I've never had to take more than, I think, a 10 or 15 percent haircut off of my fees uh, to get one of these resolved short of full-on litigation. Um, the nice thing is that if you do wind up litigating, not all judges, but many judges will recognize that the defense billing is now at issue. Because if the defense is going to criticize what you've done, you've got reasons to do it by showing what they have done. If they say your fees are unreasonable, maybe a decent measure is how much Boeing has paid their, them. Um, and defendants don't like that. So, um, you know, keep, keep good track of your time, but don't shy away from that fight if you need to. Um, so who can be a relator? Um, it says a person. Uh, doesn't say a citizen. Doesn't say an American. Says a person. So I've represented um, foreign um, nationals in false claims cases. And since we all know from Mitt Romney in 2012, corporations are persons too. Um, you can incorporate, and the corporation can be the person under the False Claims Act, and your client can effectively be the agent of the corporation. There are things you need to do to fine tune that, but that actually can help um, if your client's in a field um, where he or she needs to maintain at least some degree of anonymity, even if their name ultimately comes out, if the case is United States XREL YNKDY um, versus Dark Satanic Mills, YNKDY, by the way, stands for you never know, do you? Which is the name of the corporations I use to establish for these sorts of things. When you Google, let's say, um, Lockheed Fraud um, 2020, you'll find USXREL YNKDY. Um, alternatively, if somebody Googles your client's name, unless they figured very, very prominently and in a public way in the case, nobody's going to see that they're involved. So even when the case unseals, which it does, um, you have the ability to protect your client a lot. Um, so corporations are a possibility. Does. A lot of people file DOE complaints. It doesn't really work very well. First of all, that establishes the standard for filing a John or Jane Doe complaint. And basically, you have to have a, an objectively reasonable fear that your life will be in danger if you file a case. It came out of a case where um, a bunch of South Asian, I think Thai, maybe Cambodian um, workers were working in a US owned, US company owned sweat, sweatshop in Guam and were terrified of going public with their wage and hour and safety complaints um, because of threats that had been made. And this was the question the Ninth Circuit asked Are these people actually going to be harmed? Okay, can government employees? file a false claims case. Here is where the statute and the practice differ wildly. Um, under the law, there's just nothing in the False Claims Act that says that a government employee can't do it. 
Um, the fact of the matter is that when government employees, even recently retired government employees, playing on their knowledge, have filed them, people's heads explode at the Justice Department over this. They think that the employees had a duty while they were in government to actually um, report this stuff and try to stop it, and now they're trying to capitalize on it, and people hate them, and they have a very, very tough time. Um, the only circuit that has formally approved this sort of thing is the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, where um, the circuit says if a government employee has taken stuff not only to her supervisor, but her supervisor's supervisor, sort of a capo de tutti capo, and has not gotten action, then a false claims case may be okay. I just I won't bring a case on behalf of a government employee. Not that I think they're bad people or anything. It's just that it's too much headache, and I just don't think it is um, really likely to work. So, bars to cases. Um, here are some of the um, um, landmines that await you in the land of false claims cases. There are only a couple but they are worth paying attention to because they've got a feature in your screening if you're going to screen these cases effectively. The first is what is called the public disclosure bar. Now, I have to confess that when I first was learning about the False Claims Act, I assumed the public disclosure bar was that segment of the legal community that represented dirty old men in raincoats um, and discovered to my shock and delight that, unfortunately, I did have to worry about the public disclosure bar. And the bar actually makes some sense. This law is intended to reward whistleblowers. People who have special information, whether because they were insiders or they acquired the information through sophisticated data mining, but they know something the government doesn't and something the government would have a tough time finding out. So this statute is not intended to reward somebody who opens up the LA Times in the morning, sees that something terrible has happened, and runs down the courthouse and files a False Claims Case Act um, against um, whoever it is. Um, so the idea, the statute lists a series of specific fora. Um, where a public disclosure of the false claim creates trouble for you. Um, some of them are pretty easy. Federal, criminal, seminal, civil, or administrative hearings in which the government or its agent is a party. Note what's missing from that is state. That actually got taken, uh, the statute got corrected to make it clear that it was federal because there were several false claims cases that went awry because somewhere somebody had filed an employment case alleging whistleblower retaliation that touched on what was in the false claims case and boom, that became a public uh, disclosure issue. Government reports count as a disclosure. Our lovely US Supreme Court has held that if I and somebody answers the FOIA request, just the act of answering that FOIA request has become a government report. So if I've used that as in part as the basis for a false claims case, um, that's a problem. And then the last criteria is the news media. It used to be everybody knew what the news media was, KCBS, KABC, KNXT, KTTV, that's the news media. Um, maybe that was the news media 35 years ago when the statute is, was written. Nobody really knows what the news media is now for purposes of the statute. So you will have defendants who will claim that a publication, an internet publication that is read by 200 people is a public disclosure. Uh, a lot of courts have said no, but you need to dig and find out what you can before 
it's filed. So how do you tell if the fraud your client is telling you about has been reported and is part of a public disclosure? Or maybe your fraud is a little different from what um, that, that was reported is different from what your client is telling you about. That's tricky. The general standard is that whatever was previously disclosed has to be sufficient enough to put the government squarely on the trail of the fraud. So that a judge who says, ah, all billing fraud. So you've got one form, somebody else has another. Um, I saw somebody's got a question there, Peter. Yes, there's a question. Uh, Marcus Mancini asks, uh, or says, I have currently two government code 1261, 126, I'm sorry, 12651 and 12653, plus 1102.5 cases. I wanted to avoid the morgue that is the federal court. 12651 and 12653 carry the full panoply of damages available. Any comments? Agree or disagree? Um, I, I am too ignorant to agree or disagree because <laughs> I haven't looked at the state government code outside of specific procurement things in a very long time, and I'd have to tap dance to um, pretend that I knew what 12651 51 and 12653 were. Um, Marcus, if you want to if you want to share that, I might be able to offer an informed opinion, um, or I could just make shit up. Yes. Well, I'll defer to Marcus on that. I'm sure there'll be an answer okay. coming shortly. And Marcus, I mean, I haven't I have a pretty clear idea what that is, but I'd rather have Marcus. Uh, Here it comes. Is he back with it? Or I don't see it yet. No, nope, no, nope. I it was the old one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, Marcus, um, so, uh, if, if you want to respond to that, it would be great to be a little bit more specific rather than have me uh, guess exactly what the nature of your claims are. That would be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Because I thought that was FIHA, but what do I know? Well, I think it is FIHA, but I'm, I'm okay. off the top of my head, I'm not quite sure exactly what he's referring to, and I'd yeah. rather let Marcus elaborate on okay. that. Okay. Um, so here is the thing about public disclosures. You want to do the, di ah, here he is to the rescue. Okay, Marcus says, okay. yes, it's retaliation for complaining about government charges, et cetera, just like False Claims Act. Uh, and then he says, no, that's that's right, 12940. Okay. 12950 is VHA. Uh, yes, it all comes back. Actually, 12651 and 12653 are part of the California False Claims Act. And 12653 is the um, uh, anti-retaliation provisions in the California False Claims Act. Um, it will help you where there is a state program that has been defrauded. If the fraud is strictly against a federal program, I'm not sure that it gets you very far. Uh, because the, you know, the triggering event needs to be a subjectly subjectively reasonable and objectively held good faith belief that um, you know fraud against the state of California or a subdivisions in play. Well, Marcus uh, says, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the reference here, but he says correct and seems easier to navigate if I may say so. I'm assuming Marcus, you mean that the state uh, provisions are easier to navigate, but perhaps you can clarify that to make sure I'm not misstating. Yeah. Um, yeah. To to me, it's a both and rather than an either or. But yeah. Marcus says yes. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so, Thank you, Marcus. And uh, that 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 is an important point because you do have you do have the State False Claims Act as well, which is um, is useful where you've got state or political subdivision, meaning cities and counties. Um, money in play. So here is the one potential for getting out of the public disclosure bar. And my screen has, uh, oh, this is exciting. My screen appears to have locked up here. Um, and I'm not sure why, so I'm going to fiddle with it while I talk. We can there see you fine. 
Big pardon? I can. I can see you fine. Okay. No, I'm talking about the, the screen of the PowerPoint. Oh, I see. Um, what is up on your screen with PowerPoint, Peter? What do you see right now? I see a uh, public disclosure bar. Uh, okay, yeah. It's not moving. Let me see if I can um, play with it while, w without doing violence to anything here. Um, <laughs> here is, there we go. It's the original source exception to the public disclosure bar. If you're the person who told the media about this, if you're the person who complained to an agency and that agency started an investigation, if you're the, literally the original source of what has been disclosed, then you can still proceed um, without being bothered by the public disclosure bar. Um, so here are the two criteria. First of all, you've got to tell the Justice Department everything you know about the case before filing. How long before filing? The statute doesn't say so. There are no regulations that say so. There is one case out of the District Court in Maryland that um, says that really um, two weeks is enough. So rule of thumb, before you're going to file the false claims case, pick up the phone and talk to an AUSA in civil frauds or send an email to them, um, basically outlining, you don't have to give them the whole complaint, but outlining a, the case in enough detail so that they will know what it is. The other thing is that even if you don't um, weren't the person who told the LA Times or told ProPublica. If you've got information independently from whatever public disclosure there is, and if it's really materially helpful to the claim, you can go ahead. How do you know it's materially helpful? You don't. Um, can you count on DOJ to say it was materially helpful? Perhaps you can, perhaps you can't. Remember that the government lawyers, no matter how interested they are in getting this information, at the end of the day, their mission is to protect the government's share of the money, which means getting as much as possible and giving your client as little as possible. So you can't assume necessarily that they will um, be fair and independent arbiters of whether or not your client's information help materially. Um, so it's, it is an area, the, there's no solution for this. All you can do is be careful of it and sort of factor in the risks before you decide uh, to play in the traffic, really. Um, the other bar, the first to file bar, the race to the courthouse. Remember that what Congress wants is to make sure that the government gets the information your client has as quickly as possible, that nobody sits on it. So the rule is that the first case in the door with news about a specific fraud precludes other cases. Um, so even if you have superior information to my client, and even if you analyzing and understanding the case than my client. If I've gotten there first and my case is sufficient um, to withstand an imagined or hypothetical motion to dismiss, I'm first, you're second, as a practical matter because companies alienate so many people, they're typically um, in a national scheme, you'll have cases with three, four, five, eight whistleblowers. Um, typically what happens is that the person who is solidly first will wind up keeping maybe 90, 85 to 90% of the recovery and doling out the remainder to the other relators, the other whistleblowers for two reasons. 
The first is um, the defense is going to want a global settlement. And they don't get a global settlement unless several, everybody signs on. So some concessions have to be made in practical terms. If um, you've behaved reasonably and the government thinks you've behaved reasonably and the other side is trying to overreach, um, the government may come in and move to dismiss the subsequent filed relators at that point. But the expectation of the Justice Department has is that the first file lawyer will come in, manage this efficiently, and manage it fairly so that DOJ itself doesn't have to waste time on this. The second reason for anybody who works regularly in the field is a purely practical one. Um, my client may be first today. I'm going to have a client who's second or third tomorrow, and I'm going to be in your shoes. So within the bounds of advocating zealously for um, our clients, we recognize that as a group, whistleblowers will do better if there's not a whole lot of um, sibling rivalry here. And the vast majority of the times this gets worked out and worked out equ equitably. Um, but the, the tension this creates for you as a lawyer is interesting. Somebody comes in, to, when I started doing this, if somebody came in with a banker's box of documents, I got really excited. That was a lot. Now, of course, people come in with external hard drives, and I'm reading through something the size of the Library of Congress. It can take a while to figure out what the false claim is, how to articulate it carefully, what the best theory is, how to marshal the evidence in a persuasive way, all the while I'm trying to do my job as a lawyer and be as persuasive as I can with the Justice Department, which is really my first audience, because we want the government to intervene in these cases. Um, I'm looking over my shoulder wondering, is somebody else going to file this? Is somebody else going to be there first? So when you're screening clients, ask them about their coworkers, ask them about people who've left. If they have any sense at all that somebody else might be thinking of doing this, you're in a race um, and beha behave accordingly. I think Ben Franklin's line was, make haste, but um, be ye not hasty. Um, the logistics- I wouldn't, but um, we're almost- I know. Out of time. We've got about four or five minutes or maybe less. So uh, if there are some critical uh, matters you'd like to address in the remaining time, I would urge Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I'm, so I'm sorry it took this long. This it's an intricate area. Here is the deal. Number First of all, you've all got these things. Look at the details about the logistics. Um, the cases have to be filed under seal. If they're not, um, you have put your client in jeopardy. You've got a lot of range about where they are filed. Along with the complaint, which is filed under seal, to the Justice Department and to the local U.S. Attorney's Office goes what is called a disclosure statement. You have to send, serve all material evidence. If I'm in a real hurry, they'll get a flash drive that says, here's all the material evidence, analytic memo to follow. Um, and then, you know, I'll spend as many sleepless nights as I need to, to get the analysis done. You really, this is really the key thing. It should look almost like a conversational affirmative motion for SJ. What you want to convey to the government is this is going to be as simple as I can make it. I've done as much we're cooperating, et cetera. Um, let me- Mark, We have one question. Yes. A request from, again, I hope I don't butcher the name, Anat Aronowitz, who requests uh, some coronavirus PPP tidbits. Any Funny thoughts? you should mention it. Last <laughs> slide, uh, or, or near, near the last slide, uh, there are a couple of slides in this deck dealing specifically, um, lo and behold, coronavirus fraud. I thought you'd never ask. Um, the essential rule is when the government establishes how it's going to pay people for a program, that dictates how they're going to get defrauded. Um, so I've looked at healthcare and 
of the Paycheck Protection Act um, to show where the likely kinds of frauds are going to be. For my money, the big one is this one in the bottom left under healthcare, telehealth. Every doctor and every clinic is doing telemedicine right now. Even before there um, was the coronavirus, the Office of the Inspector General found that fully about 15% of the bills to Medicare for telemedicine programs were inappropriate and were not supported and shouldn't have been paid. And that was before the coronavirus. Imagine what it's like now. Um, with the telemedicine programs, you're getting telemarketing. Seniors are going to be called up and offered DME, durable medical equipment. How do we know? Because there's always already, but even before coronavirus, been a nationwide sweep and arrest like that. Um, I could contact a doctor in Enid, Oklahoma, and get her to prescribe OxyContin for me over the phone. She can now send me a pr prescription I can use in Los Angeles, even though she's never seen me before. Oh, what fun. There's going to be a ton of that. Um, on the other side, you've got a list of just right now some of the areas in the Paycheck Protection Program. The SBA has said that um, um, the banks are going to be held harmless um, for not having processed these quickly since they were under such pressure to get this to um, the uh, get this into the SBA. However, um, Mnuchin said today, um, any claim um, under the PPP for more than $2 million is going to be audited. If you have somebody with inside information about um, how this was gamed and what was submitted, um, you can absolutely um, beat the audit to the punch with the False Claims Act case. As you can tell, this is a lot of fun. I tend to uh, obsess about it. I've got to say, um, this is the most rewarding area, not just financially, but ethically uh, of the law I've ever been involved with. And when I discovered this, um, I pretty much jettisoned everything else I was doing um, because I, I get to get money back for the government, vindic not just protect whistleblowers economically um, and give them a sense that somebody's listened to them, but also to get the companies to stop what they wanted the companies to stop doing in the first place. I just love this stuff. Um, if you catch one of these, it's worth taking a close look at. Thanks. Thank, whoops. Thank you, Mark. This was extremely informative and interesting. And I, I wanna thank you. And whoops, there's one, something in the chat. Let me see if we have, uh, oh, oh, this is very nice. Anata Ronowitz, who posed the last question, says, I love this presentation. Thank you. And I think we can all oh, echo you. that. Oh, all shucks. Echo. Thanks for sticking with me. <laughs> You're welcome. And good night, everybody. And have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.